Hi. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen these seminars before, my name is Art Bergeron. Uh, I do nothing but elder law and I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. Uh, I'm, and I'm doing these seminars monthly instead of the seminars that, that I would have been doing uh, at your senior center or at the local library. Uh, and by, uh, through the cooperation of your local cable station, they've agreed to put up these seminars uh, on a regular basis. So this month we're talking, because it's, it's March, we're talking about taxes. Now, we're, not in, we're talking about income taxes, but before we start, I want you to be clear. The, the goal of this is not to have you come away with a great list of all the possible tax loopholes and deductions and stuff that you can use. Uh, the goal is to really get you to, to appreciate that you probably do want to talk to somebody before you file your taxes or before you decide that you don't need to file your taxes. Uh, and that person is probably an accountant. It's an accountant or a tax lawyer. Um, you may want to talk to your attorney to the extent that he may, he or she may have some specific information about kind of some specialized deductions that perhaps your accountant doesn't run into very much. But in general, you want to talk to your accountant because accountants love this stuff and, and tax preparers. That's why they do it. And, and, and unless you do love it yourself and unless you're spending your time keeping up with it, this is the kind of law, tax law, is very much like the elder law work that I do regarding mass health and other things. It is law that changes all the time. So even if you really knew all of this stuff three years ago, uh, the income tax system changed dramatically in 2018. Things are constantly changing. We now have a new administration federally. Things may be changing again. So the key to this is to kind of open your mind to some of these possibilities. Now, uh, if you've seen my shows before, you know I'm always talking about my friends Frank and Mary and their kids Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about them again. We're going to assume that we're talking about income tax issues that are of concern to Frank and Mary uh, this year, uh, and that they're married and filing jointly. Um, here are their assets. We're assuming here that Frank and Mary are 80 years old. They, still, they own a house worth $400,000. They have a savings account. It's worth about $200,000. Frank's got an IRA worth about $200,000. Um, so those are their assets. The question basically is what is their income? What was their income for last year? Well, Frank had Social Security payments of $2,000 a month, so that's $24,000. Uh, Mary had Social Security payments that were half of Frank's, so that's $1,000 a month or $12,000. Um, we're assuming that their interest from their savings account wasn't earning a whole lot, but was earning 2%. 2% of $200,000 would be $4,000. And then they had an IRA. Frank has an IRA worth uh, $200,000. And the question is, so... What's the, what, you know, how much is the tax on that? And we're going to talk about that a little bit. So the first question that Frank and Mary need to ask themselves is whether they have to file a tax return at all, whether they have to file one, as opposed to whether they just want to file one, even though they don't have to. And we're going to kind of get to that uh, in a second. So here are the rules. The federal rule, you have to file an income tax return if... Uh, your income, uh, exceed, ex excluding Social Security, exceeds certain federal minimums. And the minimum if you're single is $14,050. The minimum if you're a couple is $27,400. So the question is, uh, do, they, do they have to file a tax return? Well, let's go back. Um, there was their, there was their um, income, the Social Security and the pension doesn't count, um, they had savings interest of $4,000. So unless they had a, a big, big payment that was coming out of their IRA, um, they're not going to be needing to file a tax return if they don't want to because the, 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 tax, the cutoff is that, that figure, $27,400. Um, um, for Massachusetts purposes, they need to file an income tax return, however, if their income, not counting Social Security once again, exceeds $8,000. So, so it, and, and, so, and once again, their income, therefore, is going to be their income from the IRA and from their, uh, their, um, their uh, savings account. So do, Frank and Mary, so, do Frank and Mary owe an income tax? Well, 
Let's figure that out. It, once again, we're assuming that Frank's income is $24,000, that Mary's income is $12,000. Uh, they have savings of $4,000. I'm assuming here um, an IRA distribution of um, $11,000. Why am I doing that? Well, the, the, the question, I'm assuming that Frank was taking out his, the minimum amount that he needed to take out. Because under federal rules, if you have tax deferred funds in an IRA or a 401k account, some amount that, uh, of those funds has to be paid to you every year. How does that get figured out? Well, here it is. Um, if you're Frank and you're 80 years old, what you do is you take the, the total amount that, is in, that was in your account at the beginning of the, uh, the, uh, the tax year, which in this case would be the beginning of 2020, you divide that number by a factor. And how do you figure out that factor? Don't even try to figure it out. There's a table for this by a factor that the government tells you what it is. And in this case, the factor, if Frank is 80 years old, if, if you're, if it is 17.9. So if you take $200,000 and you divide by 17.9, what you get is $11,000. And that was Frank's required minimum distribution that he needed to be taking out of his account by the end of 2020. Now, he, remember, he could have taken out more than that, and we're gonna talk about that, but that was the required minimum. So, now, to figure out whether or not Frank and Mary owe income tax, this is what you have to do. And once again, as you can see from going through this exercise, you don't necessarily wanna be having to do this yourself. So, first, you take Frank and Mary's income from Social Security. This, this is simply to figure out how much tax Mary and Frank have to pay on their Social Security income. Many people feel they don't have to pay any tax on their Social Security income, but you actually have to do, you actually do in certain situations like this one. Assume that Frank and Mary's Social Security income is $36,000. Remember, uh, $24,000 for Frank and $12,000 for Mary. Uh, assume or take 50% take of that. That's $18,000. Now, once you, once you know that number, then you add together all of their other income. In this case, his IRA, and we're, 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 we were, we've figured out that he's, he paid himself $11,000, that was his required minimum distribution, and the interest, the interest income, that was $4,000 for a total of fifteen. dollars So $18,000 plus fifteen dollars means that their total income for purposes of figuring out whether they're going to owe any Social Security income tax is $33,000. Once you take, once you get that number, you subtract from it the Social Security credit. How much is that? It changes all the time, but assume, but, but, but in this situation for last year, that magic number was $32,000 for a couple. 33,000 minus 32,000, or excuse me, 33,000 um, 33, minus 32,000 um, means that the Social Security taxable income would have been, and, and then you take half of that, and it would have ended up being $500. So 33,000 minus 32,000 was $1,000. Half of that was 500. So the taxable income of Frank and Mary was $500 last year. Um, now, that's how you figure out the social security piece. To figure out if they really owed a tax, you take that $500, you add the, the 11,000, which was the IRA distribution, you add the interest income, which was $4,000. The total is $15,500. Take that and compare it to the minimum subject to tax. And the minimum subject to tax was their standard deduction plus an elderly credit plus an elderly deduction. That magic number was $27,400. Their taxable income of fifteen five dollars was less than twenty-seven four. dollars Therefore, they did not have to pay a tax they would not have to pay a tax in 2021, right? An amazing thing. And, and once again, as I'm suggesting, don't try to figure it out yourself. But then you, you look at these numbers and you say, well, you know, in that case, you know, I, you know I, I, as we already discussed, I'm not gonna have to file a, I don't have to file an income tax return. I'm not gonna pay a tax. So why do I think about any of this stuff at all? 
Well, to understand why Frank and Mary may want to think about this, not this year, because all of the, everything that we just described is stuff that's now fixed in stone. But thinking about how Frank and Mary want to think about their tax return for next year, remember this. If Frank and Mary's uh, taxable income is higher than zero, but less than $19,700, the tax rate that they pay is only 10%. Uh, if the income is higher than that, the income between 19,700 and 80,200 is 12%. If the income is higher than that, the income between 80,000 and 160,000 gets taxed at 22%. Each chunk of income gets taxed at a different rate. So think about this as what Frank and Mary's strategy might be for next year if they wanted to think about it. Remember, I'm just kind of going, going back for a second. Not only um, um, did Frank and Mary not have to pay a tax this year because their income, remember the taxable income was only 15,005, but they wouldn't have had to pay a tax even if their income had been $11,900 higher because as long as their total income was not higher than that magic $27,400 number, they wouldn't have had to pay a tax. So even if Frank and Mary had decided that Frank was going to take more money out of his IRA last year than that minimum amount of $11,000, even if he had taken another $11,900 out of the IRA, they still would have paid zero in tax. And at that point, they would have pulled the money out of the IRA so that it would never be taxable again. So, one, so, so think about, and, and even if he had pulled out even more than that, he would have paid very little in tax. So for example, if Frank had taken an IRA distribution last year of an additional $11,900, none of that would have been taxable. If he pulled out in addition to that another $19,700, it would have been taxable, but only at 10%. If he had pulled out an additional $60,500, that would have been taxable, but only at 12%. So he could have pulled out 92,100 additional dollars and basically, in other words, taken out about 100,000 out of his $200,000 IRA and only paid $9,230 in tax. So to the extent that Frank and Mary are concerned that in the future, they might need to pull out a lot of money in a particular year because one of them was stuck at home and, and needed a lot of home care because there were major improvements that had to be done to the house. They can, they can get this money untrapped where it isn't stuck in an IRA on which a ton of money is going to have to get paid um, by simply taking these steps. Now, I also want to mention this because many, many seniors are, are, are just so averse to pulling money out of their IRA because they want to leave it for their kids, right? And they don't want to pay tax on it now, they want to leave it for their kids. Now, as I just mentioned, there's some chunk of money, over $11,000 in this particular case that Frank and Mary could have pulled out without paying any tax. But what about pulling out, pulling out more than that? Well, remember they have three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Suppose they were assuming that all of their IRA money when they died was going to go to Peter. And suppose he was doing very well. Suppose he's a lawyer. Suppose he's in Massachusetts, which has a 5% state income tax in addition to his federal tax, or in New York, where they have a graduated tax, his, his, his state tax could be another 20%. But assume that he's in Massachusetts. If, if, Frank, and Mary, if Frank dies and leave all of, leaves all of his money to Peter, and Peter is then pulling the money out of that IRA, that, that his tax rate in Massachusetts, if he has income of more than 80, he and his wife have income of more than $80,200 a year, is going to be 22%. He's going to end up paying $44,000 on that $200,000 IRA. Whereas if Frank had taken it out, maybe over a couple of years or more gradually, Frank's, Frank's tax on this money would end up being much, much lower. And as a result, he's going to be able to leave a lot more to Peter. So once again, the reason why I, I suggest this, I, I wanted to go through the numbers just so that you could see that the calculation is, is worth making. 
You don't necessarily have to need or, or want to have to figure out how to do that calculation, but talk to somebody about it. Talk to an accountant. Remember, these guys love that stuff. That's why they're accountants. Or that's why they're tax preparers. Next, remember Frank and Mary do not have to file a federal or state uh, income tax return in their current situation. But maybe there's some situation that they might, where they might want to. This is it, the so-called mass circuit breaker program. Remember, um, Frank and Mary own a house and it's worth $400,000. The circuit breaker program is designed, uh, it's, a, it's a, a tax credit program from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and it's designed to help people stay in their home. And the way it works is this. If you own a home um, and, you are, and you're paying more in tax um, and um, water and sewer bills, than a percentage of your income, the difference Massachusetts will send you a check for. They will reimburse you for that difference, even if you're not otherwise paying in any income tax. So take this situation. Remember, remember um, the, the house value is $400,000. Assume that you're in a town, um, actually like my hometown, where the tax rate is about $15 a thousand. $15 a thousand means 1.5%, right? 1.5% of $400,000 is $6,000. So the tax, the tax on this house last year would have been $6,000. Now assume that in addition to that tax, Mary, uh, Frank and Mary paid $1,000 in water and sewer bills. That's not out of line um, with what a lot of people are paying. 50% of that is $500. The way the circuit breaker program works is you take, four, you take the $6,000, you add the $500, so your total amount for, for these purposes that you paid was $6,500. Um, you then compare it to 10% of your income. Now, in this case, Social Security income does get included. Remember Frank and Mary's total income, including their Social Security income, the, 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 um, the, the required minimum distribution and the, um, the uh, interest income was $51,000. 10% of $51,000 is $5,100. So Frank and Mary are entitled to a credit up to a certain maximum equal to that number, 10% of their total income. Their credit, therefore, would be $6,500 minus that 5,100. So it's the a 10%. It was it because their total income was 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 10% of um, $51,000 or 5,100. 6,500 minus 5,100 is the credit they would be entitled to, or 1,400, but with a cap. The cap in Massachusetts, and this changes every year. The cap in Massachusetts for 2020 was $1,150. So what they would be entitled to from the Commonwealth, despite the fact that they weren't pay otherwise paying any tax or required to file a tax return, would have been $1,150. Remember though, in order for them to get this credit, they have to file a Massachusetts tax return and they have to file a federal tax return. So for Frank and Mary, for a lot of you who have a home but don't have big income, and once again, I'm, I'm using this example because this is very common among my clients. If you've got a home and you don't have big income, but you've probably paid off your mortgage, you know, and, and so you're still, but you, so your biggest bill, other than food, is often taxes and insurance, right? This is a big deal. For you to be able to get a check for $1,150, and all you have to do is simply file the tax return. So. The, so that's, those are two things. The third thing, using the medical deduction. So um, Frank and Mary right now are healthy and they're living their lives and they're doing fine. And so many times they wouldn't even kind of think about the medical deduction. You, you typically think of the medical deduction as being a deduction to be used if you've got really big medical bills. And oftentimes Seniors don't have really big medical bills that are unreimbursed because they're all on Medicare. But be aware of this. First of all, first of all, remember how the medical deduction works. The medical deduction, you're allowed to take a medical deduction 
Uh, if all of your medical expenses, including, by the way, um, long -term, your long-term care insurance premium, um, as well as other um, uh, um, insurance costs, although insurance costs for Frank and Mary are always going to be pretty low because they're on Medicare, right? But the long-term care insurance can be a big bill. If, if, if the insurance costs plus the, 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 uh, the amount out of pocket that you've paid for drugs or for whatever exceeds 7.5% of your total, in, of your total uh, taxable income, um, then the, 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 the additional amount can be, is a medical deduction. Now, when you're figuring all of that out, you always want to compare what your total medical deduction plus your other deductions would be. Like, for example, in Massachusetts, your deductions for your state income tax, your deductions for your, for your real estate tax, compared to the standard deduction of 27400 So once again, you'd want to have an accountant think about this. But if you've got big medical expenses, then, then this could be a way of substantially reducing your income tax. Now, think outside the box when you're thinking of medical expenses. For example, if you have a medical condition and, as re, and, and, and to deal with that medical condition, your doctor says that you need modifications to your home, those are medical deductions. If you need an elevator, if you need ramps and grab bars, now of course, ramps and grab bars, those are small numbers, but the elevator isn't. And, and as, I've, as I actually uh, uh, talked about in my last seminar, the one that I did back in February, Elevators have, are becoming an increasingly popular way of dealing with the rehab of homes th uh, that are two-story homes, where as a result of your medical condition, you just can never get up the stairs, right? So if, if, these, if these expenses are done to improve your home because the doctor says you need them, the total cost of those repairs can be a medical deduction. The only limitation on that is if, the, if those changes in the house increase the value of the house, then to the extent that they increase the value of the house, that the, they, won't, they won't be a medical deduction. So you're going to need something from your doctor that says the improvements are needed. You're probably going to need something from a real estate broker to say whether or not these improvements have changed the value of your house. Um, second, using this medical deduction. Many people, once again, think of medical deduction as being medical. They think of being, it being, we're paying the hospital, I'm paying my drugs, I'm paying these kinds of costs. They don't think about this. Uh, if you, if either you or your spouse needs home care in order to stay at home, because in the opinion of uh, your, your, your nurse or your doctor or a social worker, because you need that care at home, either because you need assistance with two of the activities of daily living or because you need regular supervision because you have a memory problem. If, if in either of those cases, the cost of providing that home care is a medical deduction. This is a big deal that many, many people are not aware of. And when you're thinking about this one, I would, I would say, you know, you want to, in, in these cases, of course, you want to talk to your accountant, but you really want to talk to your care provider or your geriatric care manager or a nurse. You want to, you want, because they'll tell you when thinking about these problems, you don't have to, in order, for example, if, in, if you need someone to be with you or nearby when you're taking a shower, because otherwise you might fall, as opposed to needing somebody to actually be there to like scrub your back and give you the shower. That counts as needing physical assistance um, to take care of an activity of daily living. If you've got trouble putting on your clothes it, 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 and you need somebody to help you out, that may count, right? So you wanna be talking about a professional to see if you would qualify and remember, uh, in order for, for these benefits or, or for these home care costs to qualify as, as, as uh, medical deductions, you don't need to need help every day. The 90 days in there is not an exclusion period. It isn't like after 90 days where you needed the help. On the 91st day, you get to count the cost as a medical deduction. You can count all of the days 
all of the days, as long as for at least 90 days during the year, you needed this kind of help. So, and that medical deduction can be, can be a, a big, big deal. Now, I'm, I'm just gonna kind of mention, for example, suppose that you need home care four hours a day, and that, which is a lot of home care. You need care dressing, you, need, you may need some care showering, you need some other things. You're gonna pay for that home care about $25 an hour right now in the, in the private market. So you're gonna be paying, and, and so that's about $100 a day. If you've got that care every day, that's 365 days or $36,500. Remember Frank's IRA was $200,000. If he pulls out of that IRA, uh, $36,500 a year, that home care is gonna cover either Frank or Mary for 5.47 years. So a long time, and now they're using money that they would have otherwise had to pay tax on, but since they're gonna be able to get the medical deduction, they're not gonna to need to pay the tax. I'm just gonna close with one final strategy. Remember Peter, the successful son, and we were saying, oh my God, you know, we don't wanna you know, hold our money until we die and have Peter get it, because he's gonna pay all this tax. Well, what if, you take that you're, you're, you're having these kinds of problems and you're looking forward and saying, wow, someday I may really need nursing home care. I may need to qualify for mass health. I want to protect my assets against that possibility, get them out of my name and wait five years. Everybody knows about the five year look back period. So suppose in this case, you would, Frank and Mary had taken that $200,000 in savings that they had and instead of keeping it, they'd given it to Peter knowing that five years after they had given it to Peter, um, that money was no longer going to be countable uh, or lienable if they needed to qualify for mass health. And suppose in the meantime, they needed that kind of home care. Well, what Peter could do then, as long as the, co the, the cost of this home care was at least 50% of the total cost of the care that, that, uh, that uh, or the total cost of living for Mary, Peter could then pay this bill, pay the $37,500, and count that as a medical deduction on his tax return. And remember, on his tax return, he's paying federal tax of 22%, Massachusetts tax of, of 5%. So 27% of that money, on which he would otherwise have been paying taxes, he's not gonna have to pay the taxes anymore. If he's a good son and he banks that money, that's actually going to extend the amount of money that he has available to pay for Frank and Mary's care. So I think we're about out of time. So what I'd like to do is simply summarize briefly. If you're Frank and Mary, you probably have to file some kind of tax return, at least at the, the state level, if you're Frank and Mary and you had that, 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 the, that deduction. Uh, or excuse me, if you had that much in an IRA distribution. They may have to pay tax, but certainly not very much. If you're Frank and Mary, you really want to look at that circuit breaker program. You want to consider the medical deduction at all times, at all times. And you may want to consider transferring your assets to that successful child so that they can take you as their medical deduction. I hope you found this informative. If you've got any questions, please give me a call, 508-860-1470, um, or, or uh, email me. Or, or if you want to see this presentation again, please look on our Facebook page. Thanks very much. We'll see you next month.